Hello, everyone. My name is Josh Hypes. I'm a junior studying politics and journalism, as well as the vice president of the Alexander Hamilton Society. I would like to thank you all for coming to tonight's event. Before we begin, I would like to thank the History Department, the Center for Military History and Grant Strategy, uh, the AV Department, and the Dow Center for making this event possible. It is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce tonight's speaker. Mark Moyer holds the William P. Harris Chair in Military History at Hillsdale College. During the Trump administration, he served as the Director of the Office of Civilian Military Cooperation at USAID. His past academic appointments include the Kim T. Adamson Chair of Insurgency and Terrorism at the U.S. Marine Corps University and fellowships at the Joint Special Operations University and Texas A&M University. He received a Bachelor of Arts, summa cum laude, from Harvard University and a PhD from Cambridge University. He has written several books on subjects including military leadership, uh, the history of counterinsurgency, and the Vietnam War. His latest book, Triumph Regained, is the sequel to the consequential uh, history of the Vietnam War, Triumph Forsaken, which caused a stir in the academic community by overturning the conventional wisdom of US military intervention in Vietnam as a hopeless folly. Triumph Regained builds on that argument by demonstrating that American military operations from 1965 to 1968 stabilized the situation in South Vietnam following the assassination of President Ngo Dinh Diem. Following the event, uh, members of the audience can purchase a copy of Triumph Regained at the table in the back um, of the hall. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Moyer. Thank you, Josh, for that generous introduction. Thank you to Alexander Hamilton Society. I once shared an office with the Alexander Hamilton Society in Washington, D.C. Uh, thanks to the History Department, Dr. Kaltoff, and to the Center for Military History and Grand Strategy, newly formed here at Hillsdale. And it's great to be talking to you all here in such a nice space. When I came here the first time in 2007 was to speak about Triumph Forsaken, and uh, the, the facilities were not nearly this uh, appealing, but they, were, they weren't bad, but they were nothing like this. So, uh, but it's great to see what's happened here, and I'm pretty new here, but um, came to Hillsdale because there's a great amount of resources, which in turn means great students and faculty, which, which really sets this place apart. So today I will talk about Vietnam War. First, want to talk about bigger picture. I'm getting to a lot of minutia, but want to kind of put it all in some perspective. And why do we even really care that much about the Vietnam War? It's now 50 some years in the past. This week's actually the 50th anniversary of the Paris Peace Accords. And um, there's a, an event on Thursday at the Nixon uh, Foundation where I'm going to be talking about this. So if you want to see a speech fairly similar to this one, you're welcome to log on. Um, actually, it'll be a little different. But, um, you know, there's a few reasons. And one is particular. There's still a lot of Americans uh, who are Vietnam veterans in our communities or families of Vietnam veterans. And they have generally been given by the media and academia, largely the version of Vietnam shown by the gentleman on your left there, John Kerry, that this was the biggest nothing in history, that there was no point in the United States fighting for Vietnam. And uh, are there any Vietnam veterans in the audience here with us this evening? Um, Got one. Okay, great. Well, the rest of you, I'm sure you can imagine what, uh, or at least to some degree, understand if you spent considerable part of your life, risked life and death, lost friends, and then you saw people saying it was all for the biggest nothing in history, you might um, take offense, and if that, that message kept getting sent over and over again, you probably would become disheartened. Uh, but not everyone has ever believed that. There's another version which is uh, shown here, with Ronald Reagan's famous phrase that it was a noble cause, 
And uh, but that view's never been very popular on academic campuses or in journalistic circles, and um, for reasons I'll get to in a minute. Uh, the other reason I think it's so important for us to, and for people who are not of the Vietnam era to understand Vietnam, is that it is a major part of our American heritage, and the you know, for Americans, our history is critical because it helps define us. Now, we, we have great principles in our Constitution, our Declaration of Independence, uh, but we have to actually live those principles, I think, to be credible as a people, and so if we as a nation are simply out there doing terrible things to the world all the time, then it's a bit harder to have a strong sense of national identity or to feel affinity with our fellow Americans. So I think Vietnam is very important for that reason. It's probably, I'd say now, the single most controversial um, episode in American history. Um, in the Civil War, you can to some extent put in that category, but there is more I think consensus among historians now about the Civil War, whereas Vietnam is still a highly divisive issue. Um, so let me talk a little bit more about how we got to where we are in the history. The Vietnam War was actually pretty popular on college campuses until the middle of 1967. So what was it that happened at that time that suddenly you've got this uproar on campus anti-war activity. Well, did the war change? Some major developments? Uh, no, not really. So what happens is that there is a change to the draft rules which says you can no longer get exemptions for going to graduate school. The exception of divinity school. So if you wonder why our divinity schools have gotten so messed up, you can look back to this moment in time because um, that's where some people went. But um, suddenly, the war meant was, came closer to home for a lot of people, and at the same moment, you have the baby boom generation coming of age on college campuses. And you know, the boomers are descended from the people who fought World War II, and that generation, you know, the greatest generation, gave them this unprecedented affluence, and... I think generally expected, well, these kids are going to be so grateful for all the stuff we've given them, but as uh, you know, we've seen before, sometimes you give kids too much and uh, you end up with spoiled children. So that's kind of what happens with the baby boomers. So they suddenly turn sharply against the war, um, and a lot of that is, I believe, intended to justify to themselves and to other people why they didn't actually go to Vietnam. And a lot of them end up getting out through bogus medical deferments. Um, in some cases, you know, there's real deferments, but um, and there's certainly also a lot of baby boomers who do go and serve. But I, I bring this up only because it's fundamental to understanding why you have this huge divide. And so you have this generation that comes up, comes of age in the late 60s, and they go on, many of them go into academia, if you look at academia, a far greater proportion of uh, people from that generation who did not serve in the military versus those who did. Uh, this is an ongoing sort of sore subject with Vietnam veterans that they're not well represented. But um, here I just point to an example. You can kind of see the generational transformation. Now I'm guessing most, most of you, certainly the students, don't remember 2003, but you had this resurgence of anti-war activity where you have all these now middle-aged professors, and a lot of these professors have since retired, but their protégés, I think, are, have been well entrenched in the academy, unfortunately, which accounts for the persistence of their worldview. So I'm going to give a very, very brief uh, description of what happens in the early part of the war, which is, again, the subject of the earlier book just to give you a little bit of background. So 1954, the French have been fighting in Vietnam. They decide to give, to give it up in, there's a peace agreement that gives North Vietnam to the communists and South Vietnam to non-communist nationalist group. It's Ho Chi Minh in the south and, no Din, excuse me, in the north, No Dinh Diem in the south. And you have a 
a lot of controversial events that take place over the next several years and debates over who's really good. This is very briefly. So President Ziem is assassinated in November of 1963, and I argue this was actually the biggest single mistake of the war. The U.S. basically sanctions this coup, believing things are going to get better, but they don't get better. In fact, they get much worse. Uh, this is um, you know, shortly after Ziem is assassinated, President Kennedy is assassinated. And then Lyndon Johnson, as he's now running for president in 1964, thinks that he really needs to focus on getting elected, and he's going to say whatever it takes to get elected. Shocking. A politician would do that, but that's what Lyndon Johnson does. And so this is one of his most infamous quotes where he talks about not sending American troops to, uh, to Vietnam. And so the North Vietnamese are here, and they say, okay, Johnson, you're not going to send troops to Vietnam. Well, why don't we, oops, why don't we launch a big offensive because we're just going to go in there and sweep things up since you're telling us you're not going to do this. Now, Johnson knows really that U.S. cannot afford to give up South Vietnam, uh, but he, and he doesn't really realize until after the fact that he's actually enticed the North Vietnamese into invading. So the, the first volume ends basically at this point is that North Vietnamese have come in, huge numbers, um, and South Vietnam is on the brink of defeat. And General Westmoreland, who's the American commander, says basically, President Johnson, either we put American ground forces into this war or South Vietnam is going to fall. So Lyndon Johnson decides we can't let South Vietnam fall. And the decision, in brief, is based on the so-called domino theory that if South Vietnam falls, that the other countries in the region are going to fall to communism. And this was an idea that dated back to the Eisenhower period. And it will get much maligned later, and the uh, John Kerry school would say that, well, this domino theory wasn't really valid, and um, they'll say, well, 1975, when things, South Vietnam finally falls, you don't have a lot of dominoes falling. And I argue that's fundamentally flawed because there's a huge difference between 65 and 75, which I'll get into in a minute. So the book picks up August of 65, Operation Starlight, first big clash of the war, and one that's not as well as understood. A lot of people think the first big battle was the Battle of Iodrang Valley, which uh, became the subject of a book, We Were Soldiers Once and Young, and the movie with uh, Mel Gibson called We Were Soldiers. This is actually the first really major clash in between the um, U.S. Marine Corps and the first uh, regiment of the so-called Viet Cong. And it's a decisive victory for the Marine Corps. And it uh, will, we later think later battles change North, Vietnam, North Vietnam's mind. This one actually changes their mind because they see we cannot compete with the Americans. They have this massive air capability they can move troops all over the place. They can hit us from afar. And so we're going to have to change our approach. Here is you do have the Battle of Iodrang Valley, which kind of solidifies the, the view that uh, conventional victory is not going to happen the way the North thought. Now, I look, I turn to Indonesia early on. And this is one of, I think, the most significant parts of the story that has not been really covered. So why is Indonesia so important? Um, when you look at Southeast Asia and the domino theory, the, uh, the Americans are thinking that the most important country in Southeast Asia is actually Indonesia. It's got 100 million people, world's largest Muslim country, great amount of natural resources, oil, and so, we care about South Vietnam first and foremost because of Indonesia, and then there's other countries too. But so what's going on in Indonesia in the fall of 65? The President Sukarno has been a man of the left for a while, but he's moving into open alliance with the Indonesian Communist Party. And this is of great concern, of course, to the United States. So in the end, September 30th, 1965, the Indonesian Communist Party and Sukarno get together with a plot to destroy the leadership of the Indonesian army, because the Indonesian army contains some uh, 
strong anti-communist elements. So they go and they uh, try to kidnap uh, seven people. They get six of them. One of them escapes. But seven, the others get uh, executed. They don't go after this guy you see in this picture, General Saharto. And they don't go after Saharto because they think he is an opportunist and he's just going to go whichever way the wind blows. And, it, and that actually is probably a good characterization of him. So what happens next? So Suharto happens to be near the capital when this is happening. And he doesn't do anything right away. Instead, he goes and calls up his military friends and says, what do you think we ought to do? And enough of them come back and say, we need to resist the communists to change his mind. And a lot of them will say, after the fact, that it's actually Vietnam that convinces them to do this because it shows that the United States is still committed to the region. So Saharto is able to overcome the units that are fighting for the communists, wipes them out. It's actually a very violent period that ensues, but, but Saharto uh, takes control of the country. It becomes economic success story, although it's rather autocratic for a while, and um, a lot of violence and some corruption, but it's a huge win for the United States in the Cold War. Massive victory that doesn't always get the coverage it deserves. But if you think um, it actually has important ramifications for today because uh, Indonesia and a lot of the other countries in Southeast Asia are now who we view as our partners in uh, the ongoing contest with China for influence. So if Indonesia and these other dominoes had gone in 1965, I think we'd be looking at a very different world in Asia today. So it's happening in China. I said this in this book, I try to cover all of uh, the international developments that are particularly relevant. So Mao Zedong, in fall of 65, is thinking he is about to become the master of Asia. He has Vietnam, looks like it's, he's about to take that, and then Indonesia is about to fall into his lap. So all of a sudden, the Americans come in, interrupt his Vietnam dream, and then his friends in Indonesia are overthrown. And so Mao shifts radically from his what had been a period of interest in international revolution, and he looks inward to find new enemies, and this uh, unleashes the so-called great cultural, uh, proletarian cultural revolution, which will claim probably several million lives, and it will devastate China's economy. A lot of the uh, elite class is um, marginalized for not being radical enough, and so this will take chi China's attention away from Vietnam and will also lead to a falling out with their Vietnamese partners. And the Vietnamese partners are communists too, but they actually think Mao is kind of going too far and he's gone a little crazy, which is also what the Soviets think. The, uh, the Sino-Soviet split is also widened as a result of what's going on in Vietnam. You have, um, both of them are actually trying to show that they're the bigger cat in the uh, communist camp, and so they uh, both provide aid to the Vietnamese, but both increasingly look with suspicion on each other, and eventually this will lead to open hostility in 1969. So within South Vietnam, now that we have, uh, it's clear there's gonna be no rapid victory, the two sides gear up for a prolonged war, a war of attrition where they're gonna to try to bleed each other. Um, now the North Vietnamese believe, and you see here uh, General Nguyen Chi Tan on the left, he's actually the main decision maker. And General Jop, who's better known in the West, is kind of on the sidelines. So General Jop, though, is saying, yeah, we can't compete with the Americans in conventional warfare. We should just fight more of a guerrilla warfare and bleed them slowly. But Nguyen Chi Tan doesn't buy that, he says, we can still fight conventionally and inflict a lot of damage on them. And so for the next couple of years, they will pursue a strategy of significant com conventional combat um, with the objective, I should add, of, of basically trying to 
deplete America's will, make them tired. Now, the Americans also pursue a strategy of attrition. Uh, General Westmoreland, the American commander, decides that he's going to focus on destroying enemy units as well. But in this case, it's not to break the enemy's will, but rather to buy time for South Vietnamese government to get back on its feet, because South Vietnamese have really never fully recovered from that 1963 coup, so they need more time. So you can see in 1966 and 67, the war intensifies, mounting casualties on both sides. The uh, American will doesn't seem to ebb as quickly as Hanoi had hoped, but um, bitter fighting, escalating losses on both sides. Now one of the big controversies over the war in general is this idea of the body count, and the Americans had a policy of trying to count the enemy bodies after combat actions as a way of demonstrating progress or measuring progress, seeing how well they were doing. And this will later come under great criticism. and There'll be a lot of reports that the numbers got inflated, which then leads to the idea that actually the Americans aren't doing nearly as well on the field of battle as we thought. But in the book, and one of the th things I do in this book at great length is look at the North Vietnamese side, because the uh, North Vietnamese sources haven't been covered nearly as well. I happen to know a former CIA linguist who translated a huge amount of documents for me, so I relied heavily on, on those translations for much of this. But it turns out the North Vietnamese actually are taking about uh, taking losses in cl close to the magnitude the Americans think. So Westmoreland's not diluted, but the North Vietnamese, it turns out, are diluted, at least for a while. So what happens is they are getting crushed so badly in the South, oftentimes losing, you know, 10 casualties for every American, that some of the commanders decide, well, it would look better if instead of saying it was 10 to 1, how about maybe 2 to 1? So they start reporting that they're getting, killing all these Americans in South Vietnamese. And so the leadership in Hanoi for a while buys this argument and say, oh, great, look at all the great stuff we're doing because our people in the South are telling us it's great. I'll get back to more on this in a minute. Um, so there is, a lot of the book too looks at missed opportunities. The military for most of this period is pushing for war on a larger scale in Laos, Cambodia, and North Vietnam, and uh, President Eisenhower himself, former president, is particularly vocal in this regard, and President Johnson uh, was pretty resistant, and he gets um, a lot of pushback from Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, who is uh, saying, well, no, these measures aren't going to really work that well, there's too much risk. We could in, invite China and the Soviet Union in. And it can point to the example in the Korean War in 1950. When General MacArthur goes into North Korea, what happens then? So MacArthur's saying, well, I'll go in North Korea in 1950 and just take it over. And don't worry about the Chinese. Well, the Chinese come in in 1950, and, and uh, a whole new war ensues. So Johnson is, and McNamara are particularly wary of that uh, outcome. And they also just don't think that cutting this Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos or more bombing in North is going to be that big a deal. The uh, McNamara goes to some extraordinary lengths to make his case. So this is one of the most poignant examples. But uh, so the intelligence community by 1967 is pretty convinced that China and the Soviet Union don't want to come in. They don't feel like fighting a major war against the Americans. And they're saying that, but so McNamara, instead of listening to the intelligence community, he says, okay, well, I'm gonna grab some of my policy people and we're gonna make our own intelligence estimate. And it turns out it's gonna to conform to what we want to do, which is really not how intelligence or policy are supposed to work. But we see this from McNamara um, repeatedly that he engages in these underhanded techniques to get what he wants. We now can see from the opposing side, we, have, we know a lot more about what they were thinking, and it turns out the Chinese and Soviets were not interested in 
going and fighting the Americans, even if Americans went into Laos and into much, if not all, of North Vietnam, which is what the intelligence community and the military had been saying. Uh, again, it's particularly important because you know, the, the fundamental premise of the U.S. military in arguing for these is the way the war is set where the U.S. just stays in South Vietnam, you're perpetually playing defense. The enemy can just keep sending more troops and weapons, no matter how many of them you kill. So if you were to go into Laos, you could cut the supply lines. Or if you go after North Vietnam, you might break their will or at least destroy their capability. So part of this story in Laos is there's an ambassador named William Sullivan, who's sort of a um, caricature of the annoying State Department bureaucrat. He will actually be one of the people in 1979 who was saying, you know, the Shah is, of Iran needs to go, and there's this great guy named Khomeini who's going to come in and make things better. So, but this time he's the one uh, arguing, he's the ambassador to Laos, and he's saying, well, don't come in here to Laos because um, I don't think you need to, and he comes up with these other programs. This one is called Operation Popeye, and they get planes to, to um, drop chemicals into clouds to make them rain, and the idea is that will gum up the Ho Chi Minh Trail, but um, unfortunately it doesn't really work, and the North Vietnamese are able to build some new additional all-weather roads, and so the Ho Chi Minh Trail will not be clogged up. This is another very interesting episode which I cover in the book, the Stennis hearings, because at 67, Senator Stennis and a lot of other members of Congress are fed up with the Johnson administration, and especially with the bombing. They think it's been too weak, that it's this policy that will do gradual escalation that the administration follows is uh, foolish and we need to just take off the gloves. So they call McNamara in along with a lot of the generals to question him on the bombing policy. And this is just from the most infamous example from all of this, but, but McNamara talks about how there's this unmet infiltration capacity that uh, North has, so no matter how much we bomb them, they can just keep you know, supplying the war in the South. So this whole thing about bombing is not a big deal. Well, it turns out, again, from North Vietnamese sources, we now know this, they, there is no excess capacity. In fact, the North Vietnamese are very short on supplies, especially food. The Dak Tho is one of the biggest battles of 1967. The North Vietnamese sources now tell us that they had to postpone this operation an entire year because they didn't have enough food and weapons and ammunition. So bombing could have depleted this further, which again, the more weapons and food they have, the more Americans they are killing. So one of the things that happens with the Stennis hearings is Johnson and McNamara being the cunning guys that they are, right before, they, uh, right before the hearings start, they authorize some new targets to kind of deflect it so that they can say during the hearings, well, look, we're now hitting these targets. And this actually does, for the first time, really uh, put North Vietnam under serious pressure. And so this quote here is from a British diplomat. But North Vietnamese do, and we have other sources to confirm, they are near the point of starvation as a result of this. But the Americans never fully realized this. And then Johnson will go on to pull back on the bombing because it's something he does repeatedly. The liberal wing of his party is telling him, you know, if we just stop the bombing for a while, maybe the North Vietnamese will, will negotiate because we'll be showing our goodwill and then they will make some goodwill gestures. And it never really works out that way because the U.S. stops, but the North Vietnamese just simply take advantage of it. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this, but there's another crisis between South Vietnam's Buddhists and the government, which is uh, a repeat of what happened in 1963, but it is suppressed by the South Vietnamese government, and it will, uh, it's very controversial in the U.S. government, but, but the U.S. ambassador who had supported the first coup actually now turns against the Buddhists because he sees them as stooges of the communists, which is basically what they are. Uh, you also have 1967, the first real democratic election in South Vietnam, which changes things a bit because um, in the Cold War, certainly the U.S. has supported a lot of autocratic governments, but we like to support democratic ones more, and we can use that to, to highlight the fact that we are fighting for 
people whose values are more like us. So that's pretty significant. Then, as about just as that's happening, the, the North Vietnamese, you know, this is Lei Zuan, who's this sort of senior policymaker at this point. Ho Chi Minh has kind of been pushed to the side. But so there's this general perception that the North Vietnamese were just infinitely patient, and if only the you know, foolish Americans hadn't, uh, if only Americans had understood this, then we would never have gone in and tried to fight them because we would have realized this. And some, some of this, uh, you know, they, they oftentimes assume a sort of superhuman capability as in somehow they have no, uh, they are completely unwilling to stomach anything, um, which we now know clearly not true. And as I said, Mao, who you would also think that of, actually says he doesn't want to fight in Vietnam now because of how bad Korea was. Um, again, we have this idea they're, they're so patient. Well, it turns out they actually are very impatient by 1967. So Lei they've, they've started to now figure out, well, the commanders in the South, you know, they are actually uh, lying to us. So things aren't going well. We need to change things. We need to do something different because we're not actually doing very well. So they decide in, instead of continuous military action in the countryside, they are going to attack the cities of South Vietnam, and they believe that the people of South Vietnam are just waiting for a revolution, and they can't stand the Americans and this puppet South Vietnamese government, so we're going to go in, and then they're going to rise up, and it'll be like the Russian Revolution. So they go in. It turns out not to work as they hoped. The people actually, almost none of them rise up. A lot of the urban people have relatives in the government and uh, aid the government rather than the communists. This is a huge catastrophic military failure. Uh, San, Battle of San, something else happening at this time, which if you heard the Bruce Springsteen song, it's mentioned in there. Um, and there's this perception, again, you hear from the it's a fairly constant theme from the um, conventional American wisdom that you know, the Americans are always doing stupid things and getting outwitted by the North Vietnamese. Well, one, part of that narrative is, well, uh, there's this big battle, Quezon, and the Americans are duped into thinking it's something important and that it was just a North Vietnamese trick. Uh, well, North Vietnamese sources now tell us, no, in fact, they were trying to actually take this and they got clobbered in the process. So, March 31st of 1968, Lyndon Johnson goes on the air. He announces that he is not going to run again for president and that he is going to halt bombing of parts of North Vietnam. And this is taken as often interpreted as sort of the beginning of the end for the United States. We're ready to get out of there. Uh, truth is actually quite different. Um, Johnson, uh, and we know from seeing more of what he's talked about behind, he actually has no intention of really de-escalating. It happens there's going to be some bad weather in North Vietnam, so they're going to stop bombing in those areas and go bomb in other places. And Johnson, um, he, to the end, does not want to lose South Vietnam because he recognizes the uh, importance of it, and he also, I think, doesn't want to go down history as the first president to lose a war. You see, in the, in the last part of his rule, uh, Secretary of Defense McNamara leaves. Johnson actually gets fed up with McNamara and, and re finally realizes that McNamara has been telling him a lot of things that aren't correct. So you have this big battle between his other advisors. Uh, uh, Clifford being McNamara's replacement is more on the dovish side trying to get America out, but Johnson will basically for the rest of his time side with the more hawkish faction in all of this. Uh, General Creighton Abrams comes in middle of 1968, replaces General Westmoreland. There's another huge controversy on this topic over whether Abrams really does something fundamentally different from Westmoreland. There's oftentimes believed that Westmoreland was a, a bit of a buffoon and that he uh, had this terrible strategy. And Abrams comes in and is much smarter and turns things around. Well, I actually argue that's not really true. And when Abrams comes in, he actually talks about, we're basically we're going to keep doing what we were doing. And it only changes later in the year uh, after the final, what's called the third wave offensive. So the Tet Offensive was initial offensive. 
North Vietnam, Les Wan particularly, he's almost like, kind of like, uh, if you've seen the movies about sort of the last days of Hitler where he's become kind of delusional about what's going on in the battlefield, well, Les Wan is a bit like that at this point. So he, in May, says, we're gonna go back and attack the cities again. And this time we're not even gonna have surprise because it won't be during a holiday. And a lot of the commanders are saying, this, well, this is crazy because we don't even have element surprise, but they do it anyway and they get clobbered again. And then he does it a third time in August and the same thing happens. So um, at, by the end of that third wave, they've been just decimated militarily because they've thrown all these troops into these feudal offensives. And so at that point, that is when they can really shift strategy for the Americans and do what, start what they call the accelerated pacification campaign, which is using smaller units, trying to focus more on getting local government into the villages. And this begins a period of prolonged success that will continue into the Nixon administration, which uh, will be the subject of the final volume of this book. Talk a bit about the anti-war movement too. As I mentioned in the beginning, they are uh, very influential in our culture in times ahead. But 1968, they're actually a pretty small minority, but they're concentrated in elite places. A lot of them are children of the affluent. And they have this big kerfluffle in uh, Chicago at the Democratic National Convention. Uh, but they are actually, that event in particular turns off most of the country because they're seen as being sort of radical, um, disheveled, spoiled brats, um, attacking the police. And so they are actually kind of keeping people who weren't crazy about the war from actually, uh, a lot of them support the war simply because they're so sick of the anti-war movement. Uh, I look at two, another part that doesn't get covered much, the, uh, you know, what we sometimes call the forgotten Americans, but there's a, uh, there are some large pro-war demonstrations going on during this period uh, and draw especially people from the families of uh, service members who are over in Vietnam who uh, believe the anti-war movement is undermining the cause and as we'll see they are a bigger element than is often thought. Mention this speech, this is in the 68 campaign. Uh, this is an, one of the indicators that, about where the American people actually are. They're not sort of getting ready to throw in the towel as is often thought. So Humphrey is trying to get the support of the main, all the main factions of the Democratic Party so there's large liberal wing, large moderate wing, at the time there's also a large conservative wing. And so the liberals have been pushing him to take a very strong anti-war stance. Basically, we're gonna get out of there. But Humphrey, now he tries to appeal to the liberals, but at the same time, even in this speech where he's trying to reach out to them, he makes very clear that he's not going to just cut and run because most of the moderates and conservatives in the party do not want to just pull out and see America's ally defeated. Public opinion polling is one of the um, most interesting topics too from this period. So this chart up here is something that got a great amount of publicity and is sort of misleadingly used. You'll see the question is, do you think the United States made a mistake in sending troops to fight, to fight in Vietnam? And you see the numbers changing and they switch over. So a lot of people just took this and said, well, look, American people are turning against the war. But it's a lot more complicated than that. A lot of these people who are saying, answering this question, do not believe the U.S. should get out of Vietnam. A lot of them, they're disillusioned for a lot of different reasons. One is they think President Johnson hasn't been leveling with them. They think that uh, um, America is actually not, you know, isn't bombing enough or doing what they want militarily. If you look, this is the more telling polling, which is, is something that really never, hasn't been brought out, which I bring it on the book, but most of the Americans still want to stay in Vietnam. They may think it was a mistake to get in, but that doesn't mean they want to get out. You'll see only 13% of the people want to get out, which is actually similar to what it is in 1965. So again, this whole notion that American people are just ready to bail out is, turns out not to be true. Um, one of the 
most interesting aspects of this, too, is that Lyndon Johnson never really is trying to sell the war to the American people. And here you see a quote where he very candidly admits that he didn't try to rally the country around this cause. And we know the main reason for that is that he's pushing the so-called Great Society program, which is a domestic agenda that he claims will get the country, uh, will eliminate poverty in the country, which, as you probably know, was unsuccessful. But he thinks that uh, if everyone's getting charged about the war, they're going to not care about his domestic agenda. So typically, the country will rally behind the president. And people point, especially the example of FDR in World War II, where he's out talking to the people all the time with his fireside chats. Here's what we got to do, and here's why it's important. Well, Johnson's not doing that. And he gets a lot of flack, including from some of his friends, for doing that. So how is the American people are still behind this war? And I, I believe it's because of the culture of the United States. Uh, American people don't want to lose wars. They recognize that it's not a good idea to send half a million troops someplace and then just bail out on your ally. And they understand that there is a global contest with communism that we need to win. One of the last things I cover is the Chinot Affair, which uh, I'm sure you all watch Rachel Maddow, but she did a big segment on this a while back as sort of showing the dastardly nature of Republican politics. So it was alleged that this Madame Chenot, who was um, born in China and married Amer an American, that she was conniving with the Nixon administration and the South Vietnamese government to throw the election for Nixon in 1968. And uh, you know, what happens is right before the election, the South Vietnamese um, government says they're not going to take part in these negotiations that are taking place, and that is seen as helping the Republican cause. But the truth of the matter is, there's Madame Cheneau. Um For one thing, she never really had much influence. Um, but more importantly, the South Vietnamese government was already very suspicious of President Humphrey because he... Uh, He's running against Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon is sort of the anti-communist guy. So if you're the South Vietnamese, you want Richard Nixon to win. It's pretty obvious. And everybody knows that. So South Vietnamese, they probably did have some politics in mind, but they didn't need Nixon or Madame Cheneau or anyone else telling them that. So Nixon does win. The war is a big part of the election. Again, he is seen as strong on foreign policy, He's you know, built up this reputation as anti-communist. He um, supported Whitaker Chambers, and he went on, negotiated with, uh, or debated with Nikita Khrushchev in the 50s. Um, now, later in life, he'll become a little more complicated, but at this time, he is really seen as staunch anti-communist, and the South Vietnamese are ecstatic, and the North Vietnamese are distraught that they've got this guy coming in. Uh, the last thing I just will leave you with, um, especially because sometimes you hear this argument that, well, you know, Vietnam now is not really communist, and uh, they've got sort of a market economy, and um, they don't really like Chinese, and so things are okay there, and so why, you know, why do we even bother fighting there? So first thing I'd like to point out is that this is part of this global struggle uh, this is from the Victims of Communism Memorial Fund, which recently opened a museum in Washington, which I'd recommend you check out if you're there. Uh, but 100 million people killed in the 20th century. So this isn't just minor stuff. This is, we're talking about a, a global conquest, uh, a global contest between our ideology and the ideology that began with Marx and Lenin. So even if we were on the doing things poorly, um, there was certainly just a moral component to be there. Now, I believe moral component's not enough. And I said, I think there's actually a lot of other valid rationales. But we think in the broader perspective, and this is also important, by the way, because if you've seen polling, there's recent polling showing that a lot of uh, the younger generation are have positive views of socialism and communism. And so it's worth pointing this fact out. Uh, the other thing. I, I'll point out is is that um, we have three cases in the Cold War where you have the U.S. competing with communism for control of a country. 
And it's pretty telling what now has happened decades later. We had first in China, the US was supporting the Chinese nationalist, Chiang Kai-shek, and we bail out on him in the late 40s, which I think was rather, was quite foolish. Um, but you know, at the time people were saying, well, he's corrupt and look at Mao, isn't he courageous? Uh, but now if you look at where Taiwan is compared to China, there's no comparison. Taiwan is highly democratic, much more prosperous than China. Um, I don't think you can compare it. You know, again, they weren't uh, democratic at the time, but clearly I think one of the points is that even these countries that aren't necessarily democratic, through prolonged American presence uh, and encouragement, they actually move more in our direction. And the second example we have is Korea, South Korea, North Korea. And if you look, North Korea invades in 1950, South Korea is doing terrible. They're as bad as what we think of the worst South Vietnamese army. And they're seen as corrupt and not a crack. Well, again, look at they, where they are today. Um, South Korea, you probably all have South Korean products all over your house. Um, I mean, who would want to go to North Korea over South Korea? Again, huge disparities in politics and money. And then Vietnam, I think we could have seen the same thing had we actually stayed there. And said Vietnam today, yeah, it's not as maybe as bad as it was, but it's still far behind other countries in the region in terms of both democracy and income. So I will, I will end there, and we have uh, a little bit of time, I think, for questions, right? Josh, we good? Yeah, Gary, I'm supposed to feel so. Uh, hey, thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Moyar. Uh, the question I have is about the prehistory to the war itself. So one of the things I think is kind of disturbing uh, is that there was a lot of sympathy for communist movements within the FDR administration. And part of the problem that seems to me is that the OSS uh, sent agents to go help Ho Chi Minh fight the Japanese. So in a way, it seems like you know, there were cross purposes. I think the majority of the American people were always anti-communist or strongly in that direction, but the American elite didn't always make up their mind. And I just wonder if you could touch on that and was there another way, you know, it, again, it seems like that, that was a failure. Like we knew that Ho Chi Minh was a communist when he voted for the third international in France and then we're giving him money. And that seems very odd to me. Yes, and, the, uh, and I think you have to look, um, for those of you who took, take, took one of my courses last term, you're familiar with this, but you know, the communists make, you know, as they're gearing up in the 20s and 30s, they, they make a point of coming up with ways to trick their enemies into thinking they're not really communists. And so they prove to be pretty adept at it. And so we'll see that again and again. And um, certainly the case in Vietnam, there's, and there's this myth that, well, 1945, we could have um, partnered with Ho Chi Minh. And, you know, Ho Chi Minh repeated the Declaration of Independence, they all say. Well, that's, this is covered in the first volume, actually. But um, he's, again, trying to trick Americans, and he succeeds in some respects, and especially on the left, there, there are a lot of people who buy this notion that, um, well, they're not really communists, and if they are, they're really not that bad, and they're actually more virtuous than the people we're fighting, and so, um, but yeah, clearly, I mean, Ho Chi Minh is about as communist as they come, and, you know, the, there's this also this notion that, well, they were nationalists too, but, um, you know, communist dogma says, well, you can be a nationalist, but you just got to put communism before nationalism. And uh, now Tito goes against that, but most of the others stay with it, including Ho Chi Minh. They, they, uh, they stick with the international movement, even, uh, you know, when their national interests may be in trouble. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moore, for your talk. So my question is one that's come up a lot, especially for those of us who have been sort of around for the Iraq and Afghanistan wars which is, you know, in strategic terms, what is the win scenario, right? This is something that's come up a lot in Iraq and Afghanistan. Like, does it it's just look like eternal occupation? Like, what do we actually do? And so I'm curious with Vietnam, right, because this comes up a lot, like, is the solution regime change in North Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia? Is it, you know, perpetual occupation fighting counterinsurgency? What exactly was the, the end date, sort of, that we set on there? That's a good question, and, and it, the question gets asked periodically, but probably not 
as often as it should within the government. Uh, but you know, early on, basically the policy was we are not going to go into North Vietnam. And even the military kind of recognized there's such as fear of um, a repeat of 1950. So we're going to preserve South Vietnam, but then what does that look like? And it, there's disagreements that just keep going on. So one version is we'll uh, just tire them out. We'll, eventually they'll get sick of it and, and, and give up. Another version is we're going to get the South Vietnamese to the point where they can kind of take this on themselves. There's also the idea, again, if you could go into Laos, cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail, then the war looks more like the Korean War, where you've got a shorter front and you have to defend. I mean, ultimately, the U.S. goes towards the idea of basically get South Vietnam to the point where it can defend itself, and pretty much the U.S. gets there in 1972. There's a massive Easter offensive, 14 North Vietnamese Army divisions come to the south, no U.S. ground troops, but U.S. air power, and they stop it. And, and I believe that essentially that strategy would have worked had the U.S. been willing to continue. And, you know, Nixon promises he will come back to help South Vietnam if this happens again, but then Watergate occurs and he's gone. So in 1975, Gerald Ford faces this situation where Congress has made clear they're not going to authorize this, so the country falls. But I think that was... Um, a viable strategy. There would have, there, and had the bombing been pushed through more rigorously or other things done, it could have ended more quickly. But given the constraints they accepted, that was the best possible strategy. Thanks very much for your talk, Dr. Moyer. Um, so, do you think that the differences on that last slide, you showed the differences there Taiwan versus China, North Korea versus South Korea, and here, Vietnam. Uh, do you think that the if we could control, and this is just a hypothetical, you know, if we could control for all other factors, does the reason the Vietnam War turned out the way it did, is it mostly attributable to simple geography? I mean, obviously, we've got Taiwan as an island, right? Surrounded by water, you can, all the people that favor that can retreat to that island. They're surrounded. Korea, you can cut the peninsula in half, and you've got water, you know. But Vietnam, we just could never seem to stop that Ho Chi Minh Trail, and, and it's, it's a jung there's a jungle, and it's not a peninsula, not an island, you know. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's, part, that's a lot of why the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the military, were saying cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail because uh, Vietnam, as it's actually fought, has this massive open western frontier, and so the North Vietnamese can come in at a million different places and attack you, and that's ultimately how they prevail is because South Vietnam, by 1975, they're running don't have the same mobility, so they, they can't tell where the North Vietnamese are come in, so the North Vietnamese come in and um, hit them where they're weak. Uh, so but again, if, if they'd actually gone into Laos, cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which I th certainly was feasible, it would have looked, it would have been more like Korea, and we actually have other sources I cite from communist side saying, actually, that was what we were really terrified of, is you would go in and cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail because they could always get supplies, and no matter how much we bombed it, they could get things through. But with ground forces, um, it just wouldn't work. Question in the back there. Well, thank you, Dr. Moyer. So, like, it does seem like on the second half of uh, 20th century, there is, like, a theme of struggle between the West, which is, like, the democracy, and compared to the communists. But then at the same time, if you put them into a chronological order to fight the Japanese, we or the U.S. kind of supported um, Hu Jimin or those communists. And after Japan, they supported the Democratic to fight the communists. And to fight Soviet Union, they allied with communist China and gave up on Taiwan. And now to fight China, it's kind of like allying up with other Southeast Asian countries, including Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So would you think it's more of a ideological issue that's going on, or, ideal, or ideology, which is also a factor that could influence the reality, but there's something more important going on. Thanks. Yeah, I do think there, it is, there is a heavy ideological component to it. I mean, one of the things that you know, get into, but I think the reason why some of the American allies in the region have been so successful is that these countries embraced much of our ideology and you know, you know a lot of people thought Taiwan and South Korea and Japan would never become democratic um, 
which is, and I'll mention too, people will then cite this as, well, we can go into Iraq and Afghanistan and we can make them like Japan and South Korea. Well, that didn't work, but I would argue that's because the Islamic world is very different than the Confucian world. Um, but I do think, um, for the most part, it has been uh, motivated by ideology. I don't think, now I think at certain points, um, Mao certainly thought, as the Russians turn against him, that there's this sort of um, Western and Eastern European plot to come out and get him, but I don't think that was ever really fundamental to um, what was going on. I do think, you know, if, if China, I mean, America has long was expecting that China would eventually follow the paths of these other countries and we'd all be one happy democratic family, which um, of course hasn't happened. Um, but I think, um, I mean, clearly it's been recognized. And one of the things too, I will say from being in the Trump administration, when Donald Trump really started focusing on China as being his critical adversary, he took a lot of flack and um, especially from the left, but over his presidency, you actually see almost the entire country, including, you know, I spent a lot of time with government, State Department bureaucrats who are generally not Donald Trump supporters. And they, um, but they themselves kind of became, came to realize this. And if you now look at the Biden administration, um, I think it's become, bi there's a bipartisan consensus that, um, you know, China through its, because of its autocratic um, agenda, and just also, you know, its desire to sort of supplant U.S. power is, uh, you know, is our greatest competition, and that's who we have to deal with. Thank you all.